more than in other emerging markets and developing economies, South Asia's growth relies on the public sector. Private investment is really weak. Private investment is weak in two dimensions. First, it's weak because growth has slowed well below the pre-pandemic averages. And then, so that's sort of a post-pandemic factor. But then there's also a longer structural issue. The, the ratio of private investment to GDP in South Asia is much less than it is in other emerging markets and developing economies. And has always been, has been for, for a decade now. So there is a structural weakness in private investment. As the World Bank's chief economist for South Asia, Francisca Onsorge has been responsible for leading research programs on key economic issues in South Asia, alongside in farming policy debates and World Bank lending. Before holding this position, she was the manager at the Development Economics Vice Presidency for the bank, where she spearheaded the flagship Global Economics Prospect Report. Prior to joining the World Bank, Francisca Onsorge worked in the Office of Chief Economist to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and at the IMF. With a PhD from the University of Toronto, Francisca's research, which has been featured in both peer-reviewed journals and policy publications, has covered a wide range of topics relating to international, macroeconomics and finance, including debt and financial crisis, inflation and monetary policy, growth and informal labor markets. Her work has been widely cited by publications like The Economist, The Wall Street Journal and The Financial Times. She joins us today on our latest episode of Advocata Conversations. Francesca Onzaga, welcome for Advocata Conversation. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> for the benefit of our audience, why don't we start first with a little bit about your story? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am the Chief Economist for South Asia at the World Bank uh, for the last year. And before that, I was for 10, 15 years at the IMF and a couple of years at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London as well. So I've worked in a large range of countries, but this is my first time I'm working on South Asia. And what has brought you to Sri Lanka? We are launching the South Asia Development Update, uh, which is the semi-annual report that the World Bank produces on the growth outlook of, of the region, but also on whatever topics are currently occupying policymakers, that policymakers are currently struggling with. And this year's report, what is the focus on? So this year's report focuses on two things. First is climate adaptation. This region is very vulnerable to climate. And at the same time, as everyone in Sri Lanka knows, governments are strained. <laughs> so climate adaptation really has to be done by the private sector. We have a piece that deliberately looks at how the private sector can adapt to climate change. And the second big topic, and I know that's been a challenge for Sri Lanka as well, is job. How to create jobs? What's wrong with the job markets? Why aren't there more jobs? Why aren't why isn't a large number larger number of people employed? And in your in your report in table in chapter one, uh, you have titled it "Deceptive Strength." Why so? Yes, on the face of it, South Asia is the fastest growing emerging market and developing economy. So we're expecting growth of six and six point one percent this year, twenty four and twenty five next year. But that is mainly because of strong growth in India. It's India that is growing very fast. And that's even surprised on the upside last year, mainly because of, uh, of a strong investment, but that appears to have been largely due to strong public investment. The other countries in the region are actually growing at somewhere around four and a quarter percent. And that is kind of in line with other emerging markets and developing economies. And the reason the rest of the region is lagging behind is that they're still struggling to emerge from these recessions last year. Three countries in the region are among that one quarter of emerging markets and developing economies that were financially stressed. 
in some form or other in the last year or two. So they're either rated C by Moody's or they're rated as in or near debt distress by the, the World Bank LIC, uh, DSA, debt sustainability analysis. So those countries are still struggling to emerge from these recessions because the debt has not been fully resolved. The government debt is, is being resolved, but it, the process has not been completed. And also in several countries, the policies that were put in place to address these balance of payment pressures in the last couple of years are themselves weighing on growth. So for the last, uh, either last year or the previous year, a lot of policy steps have been taken to restrict imports, for example, in several countries. Now, these have been unwound or partially unwound, but it still takes a little bit of time for economic activity to, to really pick up after this unwind. So the growth that you said in India is extremely strong. Is that a cyclical factor that they had low growth during COVID and it catch up or there are certain structural changes that are driving the growth? Um, there is, so we assume that that strong growth is going to normalize this year. So last year was very strong, around 7%. This year we expect something around 6.5% because we expect last year's boost to unwind. The, it's especially one quarter, the third quarter of their fiscal year that was very, very strong. And that will unwind as investment normalizes. That quarter was really mainly driven by investment. And even government services growth was stronger than expected, stronger than the rest of the economy. So a lot of that boost last year seems to have reflected in some form or other government activity. And that is some, a reflection of the broader region as well. More than in other emerging markets and developing economies, South Asia's growth relies on the public sector. Private investment is really weak. Private investment is weak in two dimensions. First, it's weak because growth has slowed well below the pre-pandemic averages. And then, so that's sort of a post-pandemic factor. But then there's also a longer structural issue. Coming back to your question, a longer structural issue about private investment weakness. The, the ratio of private investment to GDP in South Asia is much less than it is in other emerging markets and developing economies. And has always been, has been for, for a decade now. So there is a structural weakness in private investment. Now, India dominates South Asia, your side. Do you think there is a growth spillover to the other countries from India's growth? So that's a good question. <laughs> it's true that India is three quarters of GDP and three quarters of population. So it, it dominates any aggregate you prepare. Are there spillovers? We haven't looked at it in this specific report, but in 2016, we tried to estimate that for South Asia and for other emerging markets and developing economy regions. It turned out at the time that there are actually very, very few emerging markets and developing economies that do have spillovers. So China is an obvious one. Russia has some spillover, or used to have some spillovers. That was 2016. To, it's the, the, the old, well, kind of former Soviet Union countries in Eastern Europe. India did not have spillovers to the other countries in the region. And in fact, this region is particularly low on intra-regional trade, so within South Asia. But it's not just intra-regional trade, the region is also exceptionally low on trade, full stop. So what, what, since you are in Sri Lanka, one of our ambitions is somehow to link into the whole Indian growth story, especially in South India. And the only direct benefit we are seeing is in tourism. Obviously, there are lots of Indians with a lot of disposable income who can travel. And on the port sector, because we have, perhaps it's always said, Colombo is India's largest port. Uh, but in other ways, there has been limited benefit to us. Now, uh, you talk about the private investment. Uh, and in your report, there was a box on uh, private investment acceleration. Um, can you shed further light on uh, what you found out in terms of what you meant by private investment acceleration, what were the findings, and what was the nexus between public investment and private investment? So it's that private investment weakness that 
that inspired us and to look at private investment accelerations. It seems that, so what is a private investment acceleration? It's a sustained period of at least six years where private investment to GDP, private investment per capita growth rises strongly. So by the end of that sustained period, private investment per capita is higher than above. Investment tends to be very volatile. So we're trying to uh, remove the episodes where it's, where it's just a, a dip after a recession and then a strong rebound. We're deliberately looking at extended periods of time. And we find that these, peri these periods when you have a, at least six years of sustained private investment acceleration, these are transformational. It's not just private investment. So, so acceleration growth. means more than 4% growth a year, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. More than 4% growth a year on average over these six years. And then by the end of it, a private investment per capita is higher than it was at the beginning to make sure we smooth out these dips, this volatility in private investment. But the, the, the incredible thing is that it's not just about private investment. They are transformational. They really come with everything else that is good. They come with poverty reduction per capita income growth. They come with public investment improvements. They come with, they just come with a good economic time. And that's what then made us look at the conditions that need to be in place for these acceleration periods to start. What kicks them off? What, 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 what has to be right for private investment accelerations to, to take off, like lift off, if you think of a plane? So, um, so what were some of the causal factors? I mean, you speak about certain structural changes or reforms that catalyze this. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? Yes, exactly. So the causal causality is always difficult in, in our line of business, but we can tell you what the preconditions were that made it more likely, these private investment accelerations. There's three in particular. One is um, trade openness, just trade and capital flow openness, openness to the world. Um, the second is good institutions, an improvement in institutions. And the third is a well-aligned exchange rate, an exchange rate that's not overvalued. So the two that are really relevant for most of the region, not just small pockets of the region, are trade openness and capital flow openness and good institutions. So what we estimate is that, for example, um, so the, the, the improvement, so take, take trade openness, for example. Yeah, the, the, the improvement in trade has been on the order of about five percentage points of GDP over the last decade or so. That compares with 12 percentage points elsewhere. So it's much less in this region and elsewhere. If South Asia had improved its trade as much all the way up to the EMDE average, the Emerging Market and Developing Economy average, the probability of sparking such an investment uh, episode would have been nearly one half higher. Now, in 2000, was it 2009, I think, the World Development Report uh, focused on economic geography. Uh, and there was some on even Sri Lanka, etc. So now, many countries in South Asia have to urbanize, significantly urbanize. I'm assuming that that whole urbanization trend will be captured in private investment growth, uh, like what happened in China, where there was a mass movement of people from the rural to the urban areas. Um, do you think that South Asia, there is a stronger trend towards urbanization? Actually, South Asia falls well behind other emerging markets in developing economies. I don't remember the exact numbers, but urbanization rates in South Asia are well below those elsewhere. And this may be one reason why climate adaptation and non-agricultural job creation may be so much lower in South Asia than elsewhere. So what, what is the nexus between public investment and private investment? Are they complementary? So that depends on the circumstances. We have estimated in the past, not in this particular edition, but in the past we have estimated that, uh, that there is a spillover from the public sector to the private sector, to, from pri public investment to private investment. But there's a catch. It depends a bit on the uh, spending, on how it's financed. 
if the spending is very large and if a lot of it is financed by the government through, I mean, really, uh, through the government absorbing a lot of the private credit, then that would be crowding out the private sector, private bank credit. For example, for we estimated in the last edition that the, the share of, in those countries where government debt is more than half, no, is more than, is more, where government debt is financed by the private sector, more than, the, than in the median emerging market and developing economy, bank credit to the private sector, which presumably mostly goes to private investment, or at least we hope it goes there, bank credit to the private sector is about six percentage points of total bank claims, less. So if a lot of the government debt is financed by domestic banks, it can crowd out private investment. Just as a point of reference in Sri Lanka, I mean, that ratio is more than 50%. Yeah, so the state-owned enterprise and the government bank credit is more than 50% because there was so much of credit growth that happened. So now India is also going through a massive public investment boom and yet they are running very large deficit. So is the big public investment uh, driving GDP? Uh, we think so, but <laughs> anecdotally we think so. But the, the last data point that was published was for 2021. So it's very hard to tell whether the recent growth was driven by public investment. But anecdotally, it appears, what, what we know for sure is that, public, that investment growth as a whole was very strong, last, especially last quarter, the last fiscal quarter, of, uh, the third fiscal quarter of the Indian fiscal year. And anecdotally, it appears that a lot of this was driven by public investment in infrastructure. But of course, that is textbook development in many ways. No? This is the public infrastructure is meant to be one of the, the foundations of development. We haven't quite seen the spillover to strong private investment yet. We're hoping it's, it'll come. But for now, public investment has definitely supported growth. As a visitor in India, I mean, you can see that physically when you go. Um, so your, your, your report also talks about climate change. Um, and I believe some previous analysis said that South Asia is very vulnerable to climate change. In fact, actually, Sri Lanka was one of the countries most vulnerable to climate change. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the distributional impact of climate change? Yeah, climate change is really a, a big problem for this particular region. So just to give you two factoids. One is this, South Asia is the region that is most vulnerable to climate change by the Notre Dame University's Vulnerability Index. The second is, on average, 60 million people per year, on average, are hurt by some sort of climate shock over the last 10 years. That's a lot of people. And it's not always every year the same 60 million people. It moves around. So it's actually a lot more people affected by it. This is the largest of any emerging market and developing economy region. So climate change is a big problem. Does it hurt, does it have asymmetric distributional impacts? Yes or no? So we haven't done the analysis for South Asia yet, but uh, in preparation for this analysis that we'll feature in the next report, we have looked at the literature. We have identified every study we could find on the distributional impact of climate change, distributional of asymmetry in the impact of climate change. So that covers, I think it was 66 countries and 12 cross-country studies. So it's really a good reflection of the world. And it, there are two ways in which the poor might be more affected than more affluent households. One could be that the poor live in places where they're just getting hit more frequently, they're more exposed. And the other way could be that the poor don't have the assets to adjust. So if they hit, they hurt more. It turns out in both instances, it's not always, but the majority of the time, the poor are worse off. So for example, in two thirds of the, the studies that we've reviewed, we found that the poor are more exposed 
to climate shocks. And that is, tends to be especially the case for floods. They seem to be living closer to rivers, or, or especially closer to rivers. So they seem to be hit more by flood, whereas a heat wave is something that affects everyone. The second, where the evidence is much clearer is on being hurt by climate shock. There, really, the overwhelming evidence is that the poor are more hurt by climate shocks than more affluent households because they can't, they can't prepare. They don't have the, the, the means to prepare. And once a shock hits, they don't have the means to adjust and recover. So they, they tend to have lasting damage from climate shocks. So Sri Lanka also has had its fair share of uh, weather events. And invariably, it is the poor that suffers the most May it have been, of course, the tsunami was an outlier, but it was those people who lived close to the beach because they were fishermen. There are people who live on unstable land because it's cheaper, more accessible, and then susceptible to landslip. Uh, so what, can what are the type of policies that governments can put in place to give uh, protection to the vulnerable? Yeah, this is the critical question. If the governments have no money, if they're fiscally constrained, how will climate adaptation happen? It'll have to happen by households, farmers, and firms. So again, we've done this, is we've taken 5,000 studies and whittled them down to 300 plus studies to really do a, a, a canvas, the world, everything has ever been written about how households, farms, and firm, farmers, and firms adapt to climate change. And it turns out, well, two things that really stand out. First, firms are much better at it than households and farmers. So firms can offset about three quarters of the climate damage, households and farmers somewhere between a third and half. But the second thing that stands out is the type of strategy they use for climate adaptation. So firms are good at better, not perfect, but better at climate adaptation because they can, they can adopt technologies and like cooling technologies and things like that. And they have access to those and that is quite effective. Households and farmers, they have to adapt. Well, if the government doesn't help them, they have to adapt to labor markets. They have to move into non-farm, non-agricultural activities. But it turns out that that's a very inefficient way of adjusting to climate change. Government policy is still the most efficient way. It really helps the households and farmers. And the way it helps is in old-fashioned development. It's not even the climate resilient kind of development. It's the old fashioned development. It's simply having two bridges. So one of them floods and then you have the other one where you can still get to markets and, and places and work. Or it's having a piped water, old fashioned piped water that works even if there's a flood and it's not all contaminated. Or uh, the local clinic that reduces child mortality when you have a heat wave. So it's the old fashioned development that really households need to adapt to climate change. Because the alternative strategy is moving into non-agricultural activities. And that, our jobs work shows, is very hard in South Asia. In fact, uh, the World Bank's uh, systematic country diagnostic in 2015, one of the lowest hanging fruits in Sri Lanka was an investment of about $100 million in uh, building new irrigation tanks right. and yeah. refurbishing old right. tanks. Exactly. Uh, but unfortunately, our governments never did it. But the multiplier benefit from that outweighed any investment in any other infrastructure. And I remember reading it nine years ago. So that's old fashioned stuff, but more pronounced during climate change. Exactly, exactly. That's a great example, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I have to remember that. Um, so moving on to chapter two, uh, you have titled it Jobless Development. Explain. Yes. So it's actually, I think this, this is the perfect topic to look at for South Asia. So when you think of development, you usually think of structural transformation. Well, that's economic activity and employment, everything shifts from agriculture into non-agriculture. And that's the process that's broken in the region, it seems, at least in some countries in the region, the majority of countries in the region. So you need two wheels for that process. You need uh, the agriculture to shrink, and you need non-agriculture and to expand and absorb all this labor 
that's coming out of agriculture. No, this is the, the, the miracle of China's development. No, this is the urbanization you spoke about, that everyone moves out of agriculture and then finds jobs in this vibrant urban economy. But that bit is missing. So the, the agricultural wheel is turning just fine. So the, the region, the agricultural sectors across the region are shedding labor just like everywhere else. There's nothing special about South Asia. That's working just fine. It's that other wheel that's stuck. It's a non-agricultural sector. It's there that we don't see employment picking up as much as we see it elsewhere. So um, the gap, so first, now, uh, currently, in the latest data, the non-agricultural sector employs about 34% of the working age population in South Asia as a whole, compared to 51% in other emerging markets and developing economies. There's a big gap. Now, the gap has always been there, but it's for the last, ever since 2000, actually, for the last 22 years, that gap has always been there. Non-agriculture has always been weak. But it's in the last 20 years that this gap has widened, and now it's really a gap of 17 percentage points in non-agricultural employment not happening, at least happening less than in other emerging markets and developing economies. And the next step is then, of course, to ask why. No, and that's what we did then in the, in the it, that was the bulk of the analysis of that chapter. Now, we know that South Asia uh, has a relatively young population. Uh, but in your report, uh, you talk about the employment ratio. Um, what exactly is that? And what are the trends? Yes, that's really that's a very important question because this, there the region differs from the other. This is one of the two regions where the working age population is still growing. So if we had written this report about another region, we could have just looked at employment growth or employment aggregates. But because and that's all that would have mattered because the working age population isn't growing so fast. But in South Asia, it's still growing very rapidly on the order of one and a half percent per year. So. The policymakers' problem is not just to create employment, but to create enough employment, enough to absorb the working age population. And that's what's captured with this employment ratio. It measures employment relative to the working age population. And that's the ratio I spoke about. This is what is really low in South Asia. So we, you know, earlier part of the year, we had this investment uh, uh, observer called Ruchi Sharma. He visited Sri Lanka also, he's bought out a book and he, he talks about the growth in the working age population as a filter of where to invest. But Sri Lanka does not fit that because our demographic dividend was before we didn't really exploit it. And our median age is 34 while South Asia is maybe between 24 and 27. So the trend, what I understood was that uh, on any one year, there is about 19 million people who are increasing in the working age, but only 10 million jobs are being created. So the unemployment rate basically uh, should be increasing. Uh, so not quite. Not quite. <laughs> because of women. Right. Yeah. It's uh, so a large share. Uh, large share of women simply is not interested in the work or is not engaged in the labor force at all. So they, you wouldn't see them in unemployed either. They're just not economically active in the official or in the labor force. They're not captured in the labor force. Statistic. So the unemployment rates doesn't necessarily have to be very high. It's just that they're not even in the statistics. And that is, that is another, so the region stands out in two ways. One is this non-agricultural employment ratio, but the other is the women's employment ratio. And there, all countries, except I believe Nepal, rank in the bottom quartile of other emerging markets and developing economies in the share of women of working age that are employed. That is a weakness across the region. Yeah, women's employment ratios are just very low, well below the emerging market and developing economy average. So that drives on the aggregates as well. So when I uh, had a similar conversation with your colleague Maurizio, uh, we talked about why this was so low. Now in Sri Lanka, the female labor participation rate is only 35 percent. 
and I believe some of the other South Asian countries like Pakistan is even lower, Bangladesh a bit higher because of the large apparel sector. Why, why do you think, I mean, and as a comparison, East Asia has very, very different dynamics. So we are all Asians, but different, very different. Uh, why, why do you think this is a very South Asian thing? What do you think is the reason? So the, 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 that's a million dollar question. Could be demand, could be supply. You know? So that's where, where the, the two, the debate usually goes. No? So on the supply side, it's, uh, it's social norms that prevent people, women, from working and discourage men from hiring them or discourage husbands from letting their wives work. So that's the supply side issue, and could be uh, another supply side issue could be education, very low education. It could be that uh, safe transport is not available. The number of supply side things, and the World Bank is working on these as well. And then there's the demand side. There, there, there are just not enough jobs. So if so, in agriculture, a lot of women are employed in agriculture. On in non-agriculture, there's just very few jobs for both men and women, much fewer than elsewhere. So it's it's a bit, it's, it's a combination of factors that we look at in much more detail in our forthcoming October update. And it'll actually be Maurizio who will be leading this one. Well, just to give you some context, uh, we have as a think tank looked at Sri Lanka's labor law, which they want to change also. And there are provisions that, that women can't work, for example, after nine o'clock. Right. And, uh, but one positive benefit that has happened in Sri Lanka is that Women now ride motorcycles. Uh, so if you go to the rural areas, it was never there because of the scooter. And uh, it's much easier for them to ride a scooter than a motorcycle. So perhaps that getting safely to work and getting right. back. Yeah, and yeah. you see that in Vietnam, which I believe yeah. has a very high female labor participation. Yeah. Everybody is on motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, yeah. The thing is that the labor laws across the region. The, the restrictions, yes, they're there, but they're not the worst. I mean, with some exceptions in the region, no? I mean, they're, they're very restrictive. But in most countries in South Asia, they're kind of below the average, but not in the worst quartile. The issue seems to be, in many cases, not just the law, but the implementation of the law, the enforcement of the law. So that's something we want to look at a bit more closely. Um, you know. You also interestingly talk about uh, productivity and the firm side. Now, there was an establishment survey done in Sri Lanka in 2012 or 13. And we have large number of micro enterprises. Uh, I believe from the establishment survey, 91% or 92% surveyed were micro enterprises which had less than four people, four or less than four people. But at the same time, uh, you know, what your report is showing is that the small enterprises and the micro enterprises actually are productivity like us. Um, and, but the politicians romanticize MSMEs that we have to. So how do you solve this conundrum that the evidence shows that, you know, the small enterprises basically seldom become large enterprises. But the policy, because of maybe social policies, that it tries to support the lower productivity, small guys, because there are many more of them, and oppose the highly productive enterprise. Yeah. You have any view on this? Yeah, you know, this came up in our jobs factor, as jobs chapter. This, this is something that seems to be really different in the region and significantly related with lack of job creation in the non-agricultural sector. Yeah, because our whole emphasis is on the non-agricultural sector employment creation. The, the, the lower the firm size, the smaller the employment creation in the non-agricultural sector. So, and that is something where the region really stands out. Most countries in the region have Again, they have firm sizes that are in the bottom quartile of emerging markets and developing economies. And it's, it seems to be partly the, what you're describing, sort of size-dependent policies, policies that really favor small firms over large firms. 
So all sorts of regulations that kick in at a certain employment level that's perhaps a little low. So that could be labor laws, that could be product market laws. But the other restriction that seems to be, the other constraint in the region that seems to be especially biting for the medium-sized firms is land. Just land markets, the inefficiency of land markets, the, the difficulty firms have, mid-sized firms, large, seems, large firms seem fine, but mid-sized firms seem to have great difficulty just getting the land to grow. So product, land, and labor markets are considerably more challenging for firms to navigate in South Asia than other emerging markets and developing economies. But the other aspects to this may just be the lack of competition. And one way to get competition is just opening, opening trade. And the region, we spoke about this, now, the, the region is very, very low in its trade to GDP ratio. That is a way of inviting in competition and, and making sure the least productive firms fold and move their, their workers, move to more productive firms. It's good for the workers, their wages grow. It's good for the economy, aggregate productivity rises. It's good for everyone. If the smallest firms can be folded into larger ones, so you have more productive use of all the, of all the factors of production, capital, labor, land. So uh, there was a think tank effort in Sri Lanka headed by the Center for International Development at the Kennedy School by Ricardo Hausman. And they did their growth diagnostic framework in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. to identify binding constraints that yeah. is holding back uh, investment into export oriented industry. Land was one of the key binding constraints. Good, I'm glad so, to hear that. 82% <laughs> yeah, of the land in Sri Lanka is owned by the government. Yeah. Uh, so we have issues with the titling system. Mm -hmm. We have something called Blim Savia, which is uh, going away from the deed system. So it is well understood, but it was not executed. In fact, the MCC, Millennium Challenge Corporation, was going to give us money mm -hmm. uh, to improve the whole land market. But unfortunately, our president decided not to take the $480 million that was grant money. Um, my final question is that, you know, as an economist, many of your findings are logical. Uh, but then the politics uh, is something completely different. Um, so what, why is there such a big disconnect, you think, between the politics and what the economists are? Saying? <laughs> you have any view you on that? To... So even I take, think... for example, openness to trade. I mean, all, all, many economists, although some are disputing whether you should open too early, the world seems to be going the other way. Yeah, currently, there is a lot of effort, especially on large advanced countries, to engage in industrial policy, which is fine for large advanced countries that have very, that have, uh, they can sustain higher debt ratios. You know, they can afford it in a way. It's a very different matter for emerging markets and developing economies that struggle to finance these kinds of industrial policies. So they, for actually a much more efficient recipe for success for emerging markets and developing economies is to just thrive on other people's economic dynamism, not through trade, for example. What you're saying, though, about the economics and politics is not specific to the region. No? I think it was Juncker who said that we all know what needs to be done. We just don't know how to be re-elected after we've done it. <laughs> so this is... This is a, a perennial problem. But the, the, I think a lot of countries in the region are now at a juncture where it actually makes more sense than ever to implement these well-known reforms because all of them are struggling with growth. All of them have to fix their, a lot of them have to fix their fiscal position. They, this is the moment where it, there is good outside pressure there is very little room to, to avoid the outside pressure to implement all these reforms. So now, now is the moment. Never waste a good crisis. Now is the moment. <laughs> that is more so in Sri Lanka because it's a crisis of many generations and this is the real critical juncture that we could go on a different path. 
So on that note, uh, thank you very much, Francisca, to be on the Advocata conversation. And uh, we will be attaching your report basically to our YouTube video. And I always wish that at least 100 people in Sri Lanka read your report. Thank That's you very really much. That's wonderful. And download it. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs>